Welcome, everybody, to the opening of the uh, fall uh, 2012 CNI member meeting. Uh, I'm Cliff Lynch, the director of the coalition. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here. Um, I think we've got a um, very uh, stimulating and um, challenging day and a half planned for you, and um, uh, we're here today to start it off. I want to plunge pretty directly into um, some review of the year and of developments, and then I'm going to say a few things about the program plan and how um, things are changing um, uh, in response to these developments um, in terms of our priorities and what we're tracking. I am going to really try and keep this to about 40 minutes, um, which is going to be hard. Um, and uh, that will allow us a little time for conversation at the end. If we have to, I might um, creep a couple minutes into the, um, the break if necessary. We'll see how it goes. Um, I want to start with just some sort of general comments on what's been going on. And, um, you know, as you know, a lot of the focus, certainly not our exclusive focus, but a lot of our focus has been on research and how that's changing and on um, kind of the interconnectedness of research and um, teaching and learning. Um, we've not really talked a lot about classroom instruction, relatively speaking. I mean, certainly we've touched on that. You've heard some very important things about teaching and learning from folks like Phil Long um, and Gardner Campbell in recent um, uh, meetings. But um, I think, you know, in any kind of um, a reasonable judgment, the story of the year really comes out of the world of instructional practice and particularly um, the emergence of these massive open online courses or MOOCs to use this um, hideous acronym. Um, you know, you can't pick up anything or go anywhere without reading about this. It's like big data, only worse. Um, except that um, it's, it's kind of really f uh, mostly focused on higher education right now. Um, I am not going to give you a lengthy talk about MOOCs. Certainly, this has been well covered in fora like the recent EDUCAUSE meeting. We have got a couple of breakouts on MOOCs, and um, I will say that those breakouts are really very much trying to get at the um, institutional setting around these, rather than the sort of, I'm a faculty member and I just taught my first MOOC and let me tell you about the experience. So we're trying to um, uh, go more generally than the individual faculty experience and less generally than the sort of, um, you know, here comes an apocalypse for the entire system of higher education as we know it, um, and uh, you know the whole world is going to be restructured next week. Um, and certainly, there's a lot of that rhetoric going around. But I do want to make a few observations um, based on what I've been seeing here, and in particularly, I, I want to touch on a few connections that maybe haven't been touched on enough, at least in the things I've been looking at. So what we have going on here, I think, right now is a number of demonstrations that have suggested that there is at least a class of course that can be done um, very cost effectively and pretty um, effectively in terms of uh, teaching um, using this technology and this framework. Um, it's very interesting uh, how this has grown out of kind of earlier work on flipping classrooms and video capture of lectures. And I think that that connection and the potential continuity there hasn't been fully recognized. Um, one of the things that hasn't happened much yet um, is the assemblage of MOOCs from 
multiple sources of le lecture video. Um, I think that's coming, and I think one of the uh, at least um, footnotes we need to take away from here is that um, we really need to think a little bit more um, carefully and diligently about the management of the assets that our captured lectures represent and the potential reuse of them. One of the things that everybody is trying to understand right now is what does what what areas work in MOOCs and what areas don't work so well in MOOCs? And um, by the way, what's your definition of success here? Um, which is kind of a tricky area. You know, um, if, if you look at a course that takes in a hundred thousand people, that five thousand people successfully complete. Um, that's not a very good completion rate by normal standards. On the other hand, numerically and in terms of cost effectiveness, it's very good. So, you know, I think we're still trying to understand, um, uh, you know, how, how we evaluate works and doesn't work. Um, but certainly there is um, a lot of optimism and some considerable evidence that these work for certain kind, these work very well for certain kinds of relatively mechanical skills. Um, uh, they are tougher for certain kinds of more conceptual things. There is certainly a faction, at least, that believes that they will not work well at all for a fair number of humanities courses. Um, this remains to be seen. I will note, just note in passing that if it turns out that these work for the very large humanities courses, um, this is going to have some um, very disruptive effects at the economics of the production of PhDs in the humanities because right now we pay for a lot of those people by having them TA these big courses. Um, that's, I think, much truer in the humanities, relatively speaking, than it is in some of the sciences, and um, we should be mindful of that. I think one of the things that is really fascinating from a kind of a technology point of view is that um, one of the keys, it seems, to finding areas where MOOCs work really well is whether you can do some machine grading of work, machine assessment of people's um, growing mastery of the subject as they turn in assignments and things like that. Now, I know that there have been, you know, sort of middle grounds proposed, notably peer, um, peer grading sorts of things, but um, the earliest ones and the ones that were really, really um, uh, sort of slam dunks are the ones where you can do machine analysis of right and wrong answers. And actually, you can even do a little more and you can characterize the kinds of wrong answers you're getting um, uh, so that you can um, compensate for that and um, help clarify those points for individual students. Um, one of the things that this is setting off is a whole um, flurry of research about how can we be smarter about machine grading on things. Um, I had a very interesting conversation, for example, with someone who was doing a introductory computer programming course um, in a MOOC setting. Now, actually, those are a lot like teaching writing in some ways. You're not just teaching people about how to write a program, you're trying to teach them how to write a program that makes sense, as well as doing the right thing. Um, you're actually trying to teach them some things that are stylistic, as well as how to translate an algorithm into code. And so um, there has been a lot of interesting experiments in ways we can, um, we can uh, adapt various kinds of industrial tools to help evaluate code. Um, I think we're gonna see more and more of this kind of, um, uh, you know, kind of creative um, reapplication of tools in various areas. Um, the last thing I wanna say directly about MOOCs is that um, these are throwing off massive amounts of data. And 
part of the issue here is who controls that data because this is data that can be put to work to make the MOOCs better, to write more effective textbooks, to make teaching more effective. The idea is that you may see frequent misunderstandings, frequent in the sense of it occurs um, in one or two individuals out of a class of 100 every year. And a experienced teacher who's taught the course many times may come to realize this. But in a class of 100,000, um, those two individuals scale up to a very noticeable spike in your, um, your test results, and you can actually start doing things to compensate for it. So there is masses of data coming out of this, and um, a lot of the questions are about who controls that data and who gets to do what with it. Um, one of the things that I have to say feels very strange in this area, as in so many other areas, is nobody seems to have asked the students um, I can easily imagine um, if this goes forward a situation where um, learning records are amassed about individuals, um, you know, in the same kind of detail or perhaps more than medical records today are. Um, at least in theory today, you're supposed to be able to look at your medical records most of the time. Um, there doesn't seem to be any such pact around um, learning data and learning dossiers about individuals. And I think that um, this is an area that we probably need to do a little thinking about. The last point I want to make about MOOCs, and this actually goes beyond the academic setting, is that um, these started in academia. They're not going to end there. Um, some of you may be aware that Google decided it would be fun to build a MOOC platform. Uh, and um, earlier this year, they ran a couple of instances, an instance being about 50,000 students, um, through a how to do search good using Google um, course. That actually, you know, I think got into a number of things about searching and information literacy and related sorts of matters. Um, and they just did it because they wanted the experience. They figured they'd help it, that it would help them improve their product and it would drive use of their product. Makes perfect sense. Um, I just invite you to take a minute and think about this technology being applied at scale as a way of teaching people about various things, potentially totally outside of the traditional academic setting. Um, I think we should look to developments like that becoming considerably more commonplace in the next year or two. It's affordable as a way, if you will, of consumer education um, in a sense that um, taking traditional educational practices and moving them to the consumer world has not been, by and large. I should say a word or two about library access in support of MOOCs. I think there are two things that are happening there. Um, it's fairly clear that the sort of, um, uh, you know, globally promiscuous admission to these large-scale courses doesn't map well to the way institutions have licensed content for their communities historically. So there are going to be two things, I think, that happen here. One, of course, is a greater drive towards open access material, because if it's open access, it bypasses a lot of these difficulties. Um, the other, though, is going to be broader community licensing of materials. Um, we're starting to see, finally, some fairly serious um, work on alumni access to content resources. Um, you'll note, for example, that um, at this meeting we're going to see a talk from JSTOR on their program in that area. And they are not the only player that's starting to make content available, not just to current um, members of university communities, but to the alumni groups. I think you're going to see a lot more pressure to do that. 
and a lot more um, pressure as well to move to more rational personal licensing schemes, more affordable personal licensing schemes. But even there, I fear the transaction costs are going to be very challenging. Um, so I think that that alumni connection um, may prove to be quite important because it may be an enabler to let your alumni participate in various kinds of educational events taking place under all kinds of different auspices, not necessarily just your own institutions. Um, it's a, it's a, it becomes a more significant added value. A word about e-textbooks, because I think um, uh, we're again starting to see some real traction there. Um, we are seeing um, some attempts to do this, at, to do licensing of e-textbooks at scale. Um, and uh, these are having some success. They look like they may have some economic payoff. They, of course, completely remap the relationships between universities, faculty, publishers, students, and bookstores, if there even is a place for bookstores that's left in here. Um, and uh, I think in that way um, are pretty significant. I do think that one of the messages that we need to take away from both the MOOCs and the video lectures that underlie the MOOCs and also the e-textbooks is that we probably need to have a more deliberate strategy around the licensing and management of instructional materials. Um, a lot of the work on e-textbooks has taken place um, through the IT community. Um, it's been wonderful in the sense that they've actually been able to make some progress and make some progress pretty fast. Um, libraries, historically, in most institutions, have tended to stay away from this area, saying it's not our problem. Yet, libraries have also spent the last 20 years developing a very sophisticated understanding of licensing and licensing terms um, and uh, some of the issues around privacy, around archiving, and around related matters, um, uh, which I think without question need to be brought to bear and exploited in these negotiations around e-textbooks. I also can't resist telling a story um, here that bothered me a little bit, um, and I just want to see if it bothers any of you. Um, so right around the time of Educause, um, so about a month ago, um, there was a short piece in, uh, I believe it was the Cron, about a new textbook platform that someone was hawking, um, presumably um, uh, just in time to show it off at Educause. And the, distinct fe the distinctive feature of this platform is that it would report to your teacher whether you'd done the readings every class. So that, you know, the teacher would, know, would be able to walk into class and know who's done the readings and who hasn't, hasn't done the readings and get some handle on these lazy, unprepared students. Um, and um, they quoted a few faculty who seemed to think, why, this is wonderful. I've just been waiting for something like this to deal with those lazy students who aren't doing my reading. Do you find this at all creepy that you've got a textbook that tattles on you um, in detail? Um, but of course, we can say, ask the same questions about our MOOCs. We can ask the same questions about our learning management systems. Um, who are they talking to and on what basis? And do the students even know? I think personally, that this is a issue that is just waiting to really, you know, um, hit the front pages, or um, as my uh, predecessor, Paul Evan Peters, used to say, you know, when the net hits the fan. Um, I think that we really need some conversations, some serious ones about um, privacy and informed consent around interactions with learning. There are, of course, all the good reasons in the world that you can enumerate for 
why you want to be able to do these things to help students succeed, to know when the students are having trouble or not doing their work. But um, at the same time, we've got to have, I think, some balance and some level of um, respect here. I'm going to transition at this point from discussions about instructional practice and its connections to the networked information world to just a few comments about the macro environment before I move on to some specifics around the program plan. Um, I don't think I need to rehash for you the debates that are going on in um, the public policy sphere, in the political sphere about how vocational or not vocational higher education um, degrees should be, about whether we're still going to do humanities, um, about things like um, whether or there are really decent jobs out there for all of these STEM graduates that we keep saying we need to be producing. Um, I think um, uh, really all I can say there is that these things are under debate with an, intense, an intensity that I've not seen certainly um, in the last uh, 20 years and um, they bear some serious consideration. And I'd invite you to, for example, when you think about the roles of employers in training as opposed to um, as opposed to the roles of universities in um, teaching, to um, revisit some of those um, points I just made about MOOCs being applied in settings other than higher education. Um, I think the world here can, may get more complicated than we know. I think that if you look at science, um, we see science and scholarship more broadly, but especially science, under a great deal of pressure. Um, one of the things that seems to be slowly bubbling up um, is a crisis about the reproducibility of results in various scientific fields. Um, people are running efforts to reproduce um, results at, you know, in, um, in a systematic way, and some of them aren't going very well. Um, I think that this is going to um, this is going to potentially, if we don't get it under control, um, really create some problems with the public support of scholarly work and especially the public funding of scientific work. And I think, you know, if you look at um, where the biggest problems are, there's some evidence they may be around the biomedical and life sciences. Um, I think we're seeing some fascinating phenomena in the publishing world that bear some consideration. Uh, one of them that I've been watching lately is the rise of PLOS One. Um, you, uh, I'm sure most of you are aware of this. What you may not be aware of is the size of that journal at this point and the proportion of the scholarly literature it's actually publishing which is measurable, um, concentrated in one place. And the kind of um, interesting distinguishing thing here is that this is about vetting for correctness rather than ranking. It doesn't make significant judgments so much as it makes correctness judgments and it tries to do that quickly. So it offers a level of predictability that is not found in the experience submitting to many journals. Um, this is a very, very real change, and I think one that suggests some, um, some interesting uh, future developments for the scholarly literature, assuming that it continues to gain traction. The last two macro things that I want to just note, um, one is, uh, both deal with e-books in various ways. Um, one area deals with e-books and public libraries. Um, basically, public libraries are being largely cut out of e-books 
um, particularly mass market ebooks at this point. It's a very problematic situation, um, and it's one that over time I think will come to affect research libraries as well, who need these as an important part of the sort of broad cultural record that they hold on to. Um, this is a very good example of where licensing can take us and the extraordinary power that the shift from first sale to licensing gives to um, rights holders. Now, the other related area is around consumer rights broadly in, um, in intellectual property goods. And here we've had a very mixed record. We've had some I think um, very encouraging court judgments that have um, supported the principle of fair use. Um, and I know that um, many of you have been tracking on those developments um, and I think we can all take some um, encouragement from that. At the same time, um, there are some very troubling things in the first sale area. Um, that suggests that we may see a ever-increasing kind of limitation to first sale. And I think that the broad um, kind of populace is starting to wake up to this a little bit. Um, a very easy kind of catchphrase uh, model on this is, is somebody going to be able to inherit your e-books? And if so, who and how? That's something that actually is starting to make sense to people as they spend hundreds of dollars a year acquiring e-books and they remember that their grandparents gave them books and it's not clear they're going to be able to give these to their grandchildren in any meaningful way. So I think that we are seeing some very interesting things that we've been thinking about in our community now emerging much more clearly into the broader kind of public debate and um, we need to be very mindful of these things. Now let me turn in the last chunk of time to a few specifics around our program plan and some of the things we track there. As you know, one of the sort of um, touchstones of our work has been understanding changes in scholarly practice and particularly understanding the changes that are driven by information technology and the availability of large amounts of digital content. I think that that's a place that's worth returning to again and again because scholarly practice doesn't stay still. It continues to change. And I think that we can, you know, identify a number of new developments there that have sort of crept up on us in the last few years and that maybe haven't received enough attention. So one that I'm, I'm um, watching a lot is something that it would be, I think, easy to misclassify as big data. Um, there, there's a tendency now to point at everything and say it's big data. Um, I, I think what's really happened though is that we've moved into a world where for many kinds of scholarship there is an abundance of evidence, whether it's a historian or a political scientist trying to examine records or whether it's an archaeologist trying to understand um, typical practice in the making of urns during a certain period of um, time and, a, and space. We used to have very few examples and studied them hugely in great intensity. Now in many cases we have lots and lots and lots of examples. We want to know about averages and outliers. We want help um, in trying to make sense out of some important literary figures quarter of a million email messages that they've given to some special collection. All of a sudden you see tools about um, uh, that, that do things like social network analysis on these, um, on these collections. 
and um, uh, various kinds of uh, automatic search and clustering. I think that these are a bit different than the, and, and indeed in some ways predate the ideas around big data, but are becoming very deeply embedded in a lot of scholarship now. And I think we also see the same kind of abundance in our efforts to cope with the scholarly literature. Um, I just note a couple of things that I've come across in the past um, year or so that I'm finding a lot of people haven't looked at yet um, that are examples to me of some um, potentially new scholarly environments that bear consideration. How many of you have seen um, Math Overflow? I see just a very small number of hands and I might be sort of blind. Now what this is, is this is a system where um, mathematicians and upper level graduate students can basically post questions and get answers. It's not really built to have lengthy, you know, kind of uh, conversational trails in the way that um, uh, some systems are, but really more to frame a question, take a few comments on it, and get an answer. It has a very elaborate system of ratings and rankings on it that allow for various kinds of sort of self-regulation and crowd control. There's a similar system called Stack Overflow that may be familiar to um, others, which is really much more focused on programming and is less, um, less academic and more engineering in character, I would say. Um, uh, actually, Stack Overflow is both the computer science instance and also the underlying platform. But I think if you look at systems like that, you are finding you know, very sizable scholarly communities now, or practice communities growing up around these, um, and um, uh, starting to use them in very serious kinds of ways in their scholarly and professional activities. Um, I think we're seeing experimentation in a number of, of other novel areas. Um, a system I've been, you know, sort of staring at for a couple of years, trying to really figure out what I make of it, for instance, is Wolfram Alpha. Um, if you've not looked at that, I would look at that. That's a new kind of class of information system which um, is got some capabilities for encoding computational knowledge and is really um, quite new, um, quite novel, I think. Um, I, I believe that we need to be very, um, very open to recognizing these kinds of new systems that are showing up in various scholarly communities. And I just recognize, I, I just mention these as a couple of examples in passing that I've been looking at quite a lot lately. Um, there's every reason to believe there are lots more of them out there. I think that um, we need to always be mindful that scholarly practice does not stay still and that this creative environment um, that the uh, digital world affords us, um, you know, continues to um, ripple change here. As far as data curation and research data management, I think that we're in a very interesting place right now. This is an area where CNI has been very active for a decade now, um, uh, trying to um, look at what was coming to alert um, our membership to the, um, the, the coming focus by funders on the um, importance of managing and reusing research data. And I think we're there now with the first wave. We've certainly seen the NSF requirements. We've seen the NIH requirements. Um, other funding agencies are moving along these paths. But um, I'd say a couple of things. First, while we've changed the regulations and certainly are demanding data management and data sharing plans, we're flying mostly blind here. Um, we know very, very little um, 
collectively about what's in these data management plans. Um, there's been some small pieces of very good work done on a couple of campuses, but um, we really need to know much more systematically what's being proposed. We need to know um, uh, what effect this is actually having on funding decisions. We also need to know what kind of compliance is taking place, whether um, any of the people actually do what they say they're going to do in these data management plans. We need to know a lot more than we know today about reuse, about what gets reused, about what's useful to reuse. This is going to guide us in um, our, our preservation and retention decisions. Um, there are, there's a tremendous need now that we've made some first steps in policy to collect data so that we understand what's working and what's not and we have some guidance for the next policy cycle, which I would presume would be a few years out. Um, and I think um, this is a place where we should all work together and work with the funding agencies to try and get a much better handle on what's happening. There are a couple of specific very sore points. Um, and while I would say, you know, in general, um, probably CNI is going to be a little less active and a little more focused in this area because as these requirements have hit and as, as everybody's come to understand the importance of research data management, a number of other, um, in many cases, much better resourced organizations have come in to help um, help organizations work through many of the sort of tactical and implementation things here. Um, I think, you know, in many cases, our best um, contribution is to continue to work a little bit farther out towards the horizon, trying, as I say, to understand what the ramifications are of the actions we're taking. Um, there are some specific areas that um, are still very problematic. Uh, one that I'd call out is anything involving individually identifiable data, um, whether it's out of the biomedical world or the social sciences world or the humanities world. Reusing this right now is very, very, very hard. And in fact, the sort of traditions of IRBs seem to be very much at odds with the traditions of data reuse. Um, there's a need for a um, rather difficult conversation, frankly, involving a lot of groups who historically haven't talked to each other very much to begin to sort this through. And um, I'm very hopeful that we will be able to contribute at least something to catalyzing that discussion over the next year or two. I'd also come back and underscore an observation that I've made in previous years about one piece of the research data management puzzle being very much about risk management and research continuity. Um, and that given the investments that we make uh, in research as a nation, as a um, as a world, given the sort of hosting responsibilities that the, and stewardship responsibilities that universities have for that research, we do need to think about research continuity and risk management. And um, sadly, we have this year had another case study in this um, in the form of uh, Hurricane Sandy. Um, we had a situation some years ago with Katrina, and um, I think um, the institutions that were affected by that learned a great deal and taught all of us quite a bit about some of the issues around disaster recovery and research continuity. Um, I would hope that we will have the same opportunities as everybody gets back on their feet from Sandy to 
um, study these issues anew. Uh, one of the things that, um, for example, is already very clear from you know, early reports and early experiences is that it's very easy to um, take an exclusively IT-driven um, view of research continuity and just say, oh, if we can back up all the data, everything's okay. Um, there's a lot more to research than data. There's cell lines and reagents and things like that that depend on freezers working and not being flooded and um, uh, various kinds of physical continuity and indeed a um, you know, fully articulated risk management program for research has got to look across all of these things and even the interplay between them. Um, so I think that there's still lots to be done and lots to be explored around uh, data curation and research data management. Um, I think CNI's role in here, as I say, is going to be Become a bit more selective and a bit more, um, you know, horizon-looking as we uh, move forward. I also will just note that we're starting, I think, in um, in, in um, the development of initiatives like the um, Digital Preservation Network (DPN) or DEPN uh, to see a new emphasis on interinstitutional strategies here, um, which I think is a very welcome and necessary complement and um, continuance of the institutionally based efforts that have dominated the landscape outside of disciplinary repositories uh, up until this point. Um, a couple of other comments. The mobile world continues to be a very interesting one. Um, we're seeing lots of platform diversity there. We're seeing a whole new set of places where the consumer world and the higher ed world meet and cross and interact in sometimes very unexpected places. Um, it's not just bring your own device and how we cope with that. Um, it, it's, it's really a, a much deeper set of questions, especially as a number of the vendors try and turn aspects of these devices into walled gardens of various kinds. Um, uh, a phenomenon that I don't think we've thought through enough. I think that, um, and I think I'll make this my last, um, my last uh, note about major areas of um, opportunity and interest. I'm seeing suddenly a lot of progress in building a true, genuine web of interconnected knowledge. And what I mean here is really something much deeper than linked data or the semantic web, um, something much more comprehensive, although certainly some of the tools um, that linked data and the semantic web provide are helpful in this area. Um, we're seeing, for example, um, uh, conversations about interconnecting um, name, name collections, authority files, biography, um, encyclopedic resources like Wikipedia, um, uh, geographic resources, um, cultural heritage resources in enormously um, uh, complicated ways that really are almost without precedent. And this is happening at scale. And I think it's a very important set of developments. It's breaking down silos all over the place. Um, these are hard conversations to have. Um, they are messy. Um, we are very weak in terms of the standards underpinning that's necessary to make some of this happen. But nonetheless, um, the amount of progress I'm seeing here is striking. And a final piece of the puzzle, which um, I'm actually starting to develop some um, serious hope for, is the Open Annotation Initiative um, that uh, Herbert von de Sample and um, a large number of uh, his colleagues have been working on. And that's proceeded down two tracks. We've had a number of briefings on it here, and we'll have an update um, uh, at this session. One is sort of broad standards, and the other is implementing projects. 
And, you know, as you move into this web of knowledge, you really need to be able to annotate across objects and across silos. That's part of what's going to make this happen and make it effective. And annotation is a problem that people in the computer science world, um, people in the human factors world, um, uh, people in the world of sort of web things have struggled with for 20 years. It's a really hard problem. And um, it's got a number of sort of social aspects and organizational aspects to it that tend to um, cause a great deal of trouble as well as the fundamental technical challenges. Um, I have to say that I am starting to see um, some projects that give me considerable optimism that we may have made a, um, a, a real notable piece of progress here in uh, starting to deal with some of these issues. And I think it's going to be very important to track those projects and to understand some of the kind of broader system ramifications of them. For example, where do you store annotations? How do you identify annotators? How do you specify who you do and don't care about annotations from? Um, those are the kinds of things that um, have to be worked out at scale to really make this work. And I think it's not too soon to be thinking about some of those areas. So that is a very episodic kind of look at some of the things that are happening out there today and some of the ways we're shaping our program and the areas we're tracking most closely um, to respond to these developments. Um, you have the 2012-13 program plan in your, um, in your packets. It's also available now on the web. There is more detail and there are also some other activities that we discuss in there that I invite you to read about and be in touch with us about. But um, uh, my time today is limited and I wanted to spend a little more time um, going into some depth in a few key areas rather than survey every bit of the landscape. Um, I would be very pleased to take a couple of questions or comments on what's been happening, what we're doing, what we're not doing, what we should be doing. Um, there is at least one microphone here that I can see glittering and maybe one further back, I don't know. Um, and then after we finish that, I'll get um, an update on any um, breakout changes before we adjourn. The floor is open. Uh, Tim Lance from Nizanet. MOOCs are a technical intermediary for a classroom. Overflow is very much like, reminds me of the tea, the afternoon teas at Princeton. It's almost discussional and, and it's self-regulating by expertise. It's, it really is something new to me. Yeah, I mean, the, the analogy um, that, that's come to my mind as I've looked at it a number of times is really it's sort of like um, being able to wander down the hall and talk to a series of knowledgeable colleagues about something, um, except that the hall is very long and goes all over the world. It, it really is, it, it feels to me like something new as well. And um, it will be very interesting to see whether some other disciplines pick up on, on this as well. Other comments, questions? We do have a couple minutes. Wow, okay. Um, well, hearing none, wait, am I? Ah, I'm sorry, it really is hard to see with these uh, high power lights. Not to prolong the time between now and coffee too far, but I, I wanted to pick that up actually. Uh, as someone who's benefited greatly from stack overflow over the past few years, I've noticed recently that it is suffering what a lot of web resources over the years, internet resources over the years, it, this antedates the web, have suffered from in dilution through success. And I wonder whether there's, and there's, a, there's the concomitant move of the rise of more sort of closed wall resources, again, like Quora, 
uh, that can boost their, their ratings in Google and offer answers, but you have to pay to get in. And I think there's this tension between the, the radical democracy of the web that invites everyone in and a flood of superfluousness without getting you know, you know, political about it that dilutes the conversation and makes it less interesting. That's a dialogue, it seems to me, that goes back and forth. And I wonder why you think this one's any different. Um, that is certainly a dialectic that we've seen again and again in online communities. Um, you know, where you'll have a online community that does very well for a while and then too many people move in, especially people who don't know what they're doing, and then the people who do move out and go somewhere else. And um, that, is a, that is a very difficult problem to manage. I would say that it has certainly not been managed successfully by any software system I've seen yet. There are probably a few communities who've you know, sort of dealt with it by social norm somehow. Um, and there certainly are strategies of erecting barriers around online communities to try and limit them to people who can contribute. But, you know, as you say, there are some, you know, very real tensions between that and wanting to facilitate open educational and research dialogue. Um, I think that, um, you know, Certainly, if you look at, at some of these, these this most recent generation, they're trying some new things there in terms of the ability of the communities to be more sort of self-policing about, you know, that's a stupid question, go somewhere else. Um, uh, or perhaps not, that's a stupid question, but that's an inappropriate question for the, you know, level of expertise we're seeking on this forum. Um, uh, part of the trick is having somewhere else to send them to. And um, I, I think that that, that is, is perhaps an important factor, not just saying, you know, um, go away, but um, for people in, in, you know, your situation and your level of understanding, this is a better community for you to go to. Um, but I agree, it's a... It, it, it's to some extent an, an inherent tension and one that um, is, is proving very challenging to manage by technical means. Um, we, we have to get better at doing some of this by technical means. Um, uh, and, you know, I think, I think we have made some progress since the early days of discussion boards, which uh, you know, showed that t that tendency you describe in a, you know, absolutely vicious sort of a way where these would thrive and then suddenly depopulate in a period of weeks as people moved on to the next system, or, or at least the, the founders moved on to the next system. One more question? People are ready for a break. Joan, what can you tell me about um, schedule changes? Okay. Um, the numbers are... Okay. Um, the session on massive open online courses has been moved to 1 o'clock tomorrow. It will take place in Federal A. Um, it's, but rather than today, it will be tomorrow at 1 p.m. Wikipedia and libraries will take place today at 2.30 p.m., right after this. And that session will also take place in Federal A. So those are the two changes we know about. Hopefully, those will be the end of it, and the really good news is that that means that both of these sessions are going to happen, um, and by the way, I would certainly commend both of them to your interest um, and uh, your attention. With that, um, let me once again welcome you to our fall meeting, and I hope you enjoy all the breakouts. Thank you.